All right, well, I thank you for being here tonight, and I invite you to turn to your Bibles, if you have them, to Hebrews chapter 11. If you'll recall, that's where we've been uh, these last few, well, not last week, but the few weeks prior to that. Uh, The verse, the one verse that will capture our attention tonight is verse 11. So Hebrews 11, chapter 11. Uh, We're continuing this series called By Faith. If you guys remember, we've been in that for a while. We've been looking uh, through the list of names in Hebrews 11. Of course, uh, we know that this list is referred to as the Hall of Faith. A lot of faithful saints uh, listed out in, in, in Hebrews 11. Now, the goal of this series in looking at these individual people is not to necessarily esteem them or to worship them or anything like that. Um, but as we review and study them, especially in light of Hebrews chapter 12, uh, we see they are a great cloud of witnesses. And what they do, what this does is it spurs us on, it exhorts us, it challenges us to throw out sin, uh, throw off sin that entangles us or things that hinder us. It uh, challenges us to run the race with perseverance, challenges us to fix our eyes on Jesus and to not grow weary or lose heart. And those are four areas that we could all work on uh, all of the time, in four areas that um, should be at the forefront of our mind. And that's kind of been our goal for this series. Our person of interest this, this, this evening, if you're already at chapter 11, verse 11, is uh, Sarah. Uh, she's the first woman mentioned in this Hall of Faith list. Uh, we've looked at um, uh, uh, the people uh, prior to her, um, but we're going to focus on Sarah. Now, I have a very basic outline for tonight. In addition to sort of, maybe not specifically answering those four questions this time, uh, my basic outline is this. It has two points. The first point is, who is Sarah? The second point is going to be, what does God, or what does this account tell us about God? Very basic outline for our teaching uh, tonight. Now, uh, under the, as we get started here, uh, in verse 11, it says this. It says, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Okay, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Right? So what we're going to do is just going to sort of build a little profile study of who Sarah is. Okay, she is the matriarch of the Jewish people. There are a lot of Jewish texts outside of Scripture that point to sort of her greatness as and the fondness which with, with which the Jewish people uh, look to Sarah as the matriarch of their, of their people. Um, but what we're going to see when we start to look at her story and her account is we're going to see some things that I think are all too familiar uh, for a lot of us, okay? Now, like with a lot of these um, characters so far, besides maybe Noah and Abraham, uh, Sarah... Um, her story is sort of woven in and interwoven with Abraham's story. There's not a lot just specifically talking about Sarah, okay? She's sort of just a part of the story of Abraham. And so necessarily, we will have to (laughs) kind of recount that story. But if Sarah did have a key verse in the Bible, it would be Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 11. This would be the one verse that's really sort of gives us a little bit more information about who she is and why she's in the hall of faith. Right, why her name is here, other than just being the matriarch of the Jewish people. But we first hear of Sarah in Genesis chapter 11 and verse 29. That's the first spot you hear Sarah's name. But her name's not Sarah then. Her name is Sarai. Okay? Her name is Sarai. Uh, this is when that they're still in the land of Ur. Okay? At this point, she is married to Abraham, but they're still in the land of Ur. They haven't left yet. Okay? They haven't um, been told to go yet. Uh, immediately, the very first thing that we hear about Sarai Uh, or Sarah, which I'll probably just say from here on out. (laughs) But the very first thing the Bible tells us about her, other than she's with Abraham in the land of Ur, it says that she's barren, and she had no child. Okay? The Bible does this a lot. When they introduce a character, a lot of times within the very next sentence, it'll tell you something that they want you to know about that person. Like they want you to know this about her, okay? That she's barren, and that she has no child. It's an important part of her story, absolutely. Okay? So we need to keep that in mind. But, We've got to understand that for Sarah to be, to be barren, uh, not only would she have been feeling, I'm sure, I'm sure some emotional uh, stress from that, it was a pretty big cultural stigma to not have children for a woman in that culture, okay? It was a pretty big cultural sti- stigma. Um, she was obviously of an age to be married and to have children, um, and so was expected to have a child. 
but she didn't have one because she was barren, okay? She was sterile, so to speak, okay? This isn't because she didn't want a kid, okay? And we got to be clear about that. This is not because she didn't want one. She did want a child, right? Um, you know, as is the case for so many today, uh, children have sort of become almost like a burden for a lot of people, um, sort of like a necessary evil for the existence and furtherance of mankind. You've got to have some kids, right? Um, but that's not how the Bible views children, right? The Bible views children as a blessing. Right? Children are indeed a heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is the reward, Psalm 127, right? Um, and so that is how we should view children even today, not as a burden as they um, so often are viewed. And don't get me started on big families, right? Big families catch a lot of flack uh, for almost being, some people would say, selfish or whatever else for having so many kids. But this wasn't the case for Sarah. She was incapable of having a child. Okay, she was incapable of having a child. Uh, we have to understand this didn't make her any less valuable or any less loved in the eyes of God or anything like that. Uh, it didn't, didn't affect her status before the Lord or anything like that. Uh, this is just the reality of the situation that she's in, right? That she's barren, and this is the first thing, one of the very first things that we're told about Sarah from the get-go. And obviously it's going to play an important part in her story. Right? So when you read in the Bible <laughs> and introduce a new character— and immediately it tells you something about that character. That's something to note, right? That's something to note. Um, it's after this that we are told, though, that Abram, or Abraham, Abram as his name is then, is told by God to leave his father in Haran to go to Canaan. So he leaves his father in Haran. Well, first they leave the land of the Ur, then they go to Haran, and then they go to uh, Canaan, right? Uh, Abraham was 75 years old when this happened. And that's important because we know that Sarah is 10 years younger than Abraham. So by the time that they leave the land of Haran to go to Canaan, Sarah is 65 years old. And this is the point of, uh, of history where people aren't living for 700 years anymore, right? This, they're living a little bit, a lot less time, okay, right? Sarah dies at 127, still old, right? Still old, but not 750 years old or whatever, which just a few generations before, that's sort of how long people were living, right? And so she was 65 years old uh, when, when they left for the land of Haran. She was barren. She had no child. But then what happens is, in the story, is that Abram is promised by God that he will be made into a great nation. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through his family. You have to imagine that this is, this is posing an issue or a problem for him in his mind. Because he's probably thinking, well, for my family to be a blessing to all the nations, I have to have a family that carries on. And he doesn't yet have a child. Right? Uh, later on, a few verses later, a few chapters later, God promises Abram that he will have many descendants. You're going to have many descendants. As many as stars are in the sky, that's how many descendants you're going to have, okay? Even though Abram at this point was advanced in years, he was childless and he was with a barren wife, right? And the scriptures say that she was past the age, as it says in Hebrews 11, she was past the age of bearing children. But Genesis 16 goes on to say that they had been in the land of Canaan for 10 years, and Abram and Sarah were still childless. All right, so Abram had already been promised that he would be the, f <laughs> he would have many descendants. He would have uh, many to come after him. It's been 10 years since that point now. They're still in Canaan. They're still childless, okay? And we don't know much about Sarah at this point, still. Other than she was barren. She was beautiful. We know that because on two different occasions, when they went into foreign lands, Abraham passed Sarah off as his sister and not his wife because of her beauty. And he thought that if they knew that she was his wife, that they would kill him and take her. Okay? He only half lied about that, though, because Sarah and Abraham are actually half siblings. We find that out in Genesis 20, I think. They have the same father, but not the same mother. Okay? So he says, This is my sister. He wasn't fully lying. <laughs> right? Um, but, anyways, but we know that she was beautiful. We know that she was barren, and we know that she was becoming impatient. She was becoming impatient, right? Uh, she's 75 years old at this point. Her husband's 85 years old, okay? She wants a kid, and God promised her, her husband that he would have many descendants, right? And so I wonder how many of you are now or have been impatient or have become impatient where you are, Right? You're waiting for some next stage in life to happen, and whatever that may be. 
And what's true is we don't necessarily know God's plan for our life into the future. We don't know the future. We take comfort and, and hope in the fact that God does know the future. And he's got it all in his hand. And he's got us in his hand. And he's in control of that, right? But our caution against is letting the impatience keep us from doing the things that God has clearly laid out in his word to do, right? To not let the impatience lead us to inactivity for the kingdom of God, right? She's becoming impatient. And it could be that part of the plan that God has for you is the waiting to learn something, right? Maybe completely change your views on what you thought was his plan for your life, right? But anyway, she has become, again, like I said, impatient. So what does she do? She comes up with a plan. She decides, I'm going to take this into my own hands. I'm 75 years old. I need, we, need, we need a kid, right? So she decides to give her Egyptian servant, Hagar, to Abram as another wife. Now, it's really best to think of her as a concubine, even though it says wife. Um, it's, a different, it's a different form of the same word that is used for Sarah when she's introduced as his wife. Uh, and the way that Hagar is treated would show us that Sarah is still considered the primary wife in Abraham's life. And so it's better to think of Hagar as a concubine. But she gave, Abra- she gave Hagar to uh, Hagar to Abraham to bear a child for them. Now, I want to say a quick word on polygamy because that's what we're talking about here. Just a quick word on polygamy. God did allow it. God did allow it uh, even, for, uh, even among mighty men of God. Okay? You read the scriptures and you see men had multiple wives and multiple children with different wives. Right? But we know that it is not God's design and intention for marriage. Okay? In the Garden of Eden, God instituted one man and one woman. We see this confirmed in the New Testament, okay, uh, as well. And so, for whatever reason, and there are speculations as to why would God would allow polygamy, um, for whatever reason, he allowed it. But it is not his design and intention for marriage, okay. All of this was in accordance with the custom of their day, right? They weren't doing anything that was outside of the norm for them to, to have a baby through a servant. Uh, so they weren't doing anything that was outside of the norm for them. Um, but just because something is according to custom or even according to the law uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that's something that we should do. There's a whole lot of laws in our land (laughs) that would go against God's word that blatantly spit in the face of God and his word. And so just because something might be legal for us, it doesn't mean that it's moral for us or that it's something that we as the people of God should be partaking in. And you can think of many such laws that way, right? Laws can't legislate, or we can't legislate morality. We can't legislate heart change, try as we might. Um, But lastly, what we see about polygamy in the Bible is that it never ends well. It never ends well. It's always a mess. Always. Uh, Think of Solomon. Think of David. It's just always a mess. And this was the case here. Because Hagar, when she conceived, had contempt for Sarah. And then in turn, Sarah dealt harshly with Hagar, right? Right? Eventually, Hagar had to flee because she was being mistreated. Uh, She did come back, though. But this is just becoming a mess of a story. Now, at this point, Abraham was 86 years old, and his his first son was born. And it would be that way for more than a decade. For more than a decade, okay? That is until we come to Genesis 17, where God promises to Abraham that Sarah will conceive a son, and his name will be Isaac, which means he laughs or he will laugh. (laughs) Now, Abraham, when he said, you're going to bear us, you're going to... You're gonna, I'm going to have a son through, through Sarah. She's old. And he falls on his face and laughs. That's his response. You're going to give an old man and an old woman who's been barren her whole life a child? And his response is to laugh. Later on, we'll find out that that was Sarah's response too when she found out, was to laugh, almost in disbelief. Right? This is a miracle. Right? This is a miracle. Right? But nothing is impossible for God. We know that. And this is in one such instance where we see that, okay? But he's going to have a, he's going to, uh, Sarah's going to have a son, and they're going to name him Isaac. Now, <laughs> um, at this point, Ishmael, his other son, is already like 13 or 14 years old. He's a teenager, right? Getting ready to enter, like, manhood. Um, but God decreed to make a covenant with Isaac and not Ishmael, right? Why? Because that's how God decreed it. He's going to make a covenant with Isaac and not Ishmael. 
Right? This was to be the child of promise. This was to be to whom, through whom the many descendants of Abraham would come. It would be through Isaac's line that the world would be blessed and the nations would be blessed. Okay? Now, uh, because we're talking a lot about the Old Testament, and in this section of Scripture with Hebrews, we're talking a lot about the Old Testament, so we're talking about Old Testament figures. I'm going to give you guys a little pro tip on how to read and understand your Old Testament, because I get that it can be difficult to read and to understand. Um, but here it is. Throughout the Old Testament, God is, in large part, simply, simply, tracing out the woman's offspring that is mentioned in Genesis 3.15. That's essentially what he's doing. Genesis 3.15, he says this, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, Eve, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And so for the rest of the Old Testament, God is simply tracing out the offspring of the woman in Genesis 3.15. He's saying this is how it's going to happen. This is who it's going to come through. Yes, there's a lot of other things that happen in the Old Testament. I get that. But if you can keep that sort of high-level basic fact as you're reading it, you may start to see some things differently, right? Or why God would do things a certain way, right? And why he brings this people and those people, right? It started with Adam and Eve. They had Cain and Abel. Well, we know that Cain killed Abel. <laughs> and the child of promise in the, in the future seed wasn't going to come through Cain. And so they gave them another son, Seth, right? Well, Seth had Noah. Noah got a new creation mandate very similar to what Adam got in the garden. After that, Abram, after Abram, Abraham, Isaac, okay? After Isaac will come Jacob and all of his 12 sons. But it's not all of his 12 sons that are, that are, are singled out as the one through whom the Messiah would come. It's Judah. Judah is the clan or the tribe through whom the Messiah would come. And then from Judah, you get to David. And then there's a Davidic covenant. <laughs> and and David's throne will always reign, and somebody from David's line will, will be the king, right? And then you get Jesus, eventually. Right? When you're reading all of those gene genealogies, when the, when the Israelites are coming back from exile, and we just skip over all those genealogies, guess what they're doing? They're reestablishing who Israel is, and who the people are, and who the tribes are. Who's Judah? Who's Benjamin? Who's Gad? God is tracing out the line of his people. Why do you think Matthew's gospel starts with the genealogy? It ties Jesus all the way back to Adam, right? And so this is God tracing it out. Anyway, that's a little nerd tip for you as you read your Old Testament. But when Sarah heard this about, about the baby coming, or she's going to conceive, she laughed. So did Abraham. Sarah was 90 years old. Abraham was 100 years old, okay? Uh, the scripture says that the way of the woman had passed for Sarah. The way of the woman had passed. She was well beyond childbearing years. We don't know much more about Sarah uh, after that. Um, she did conceive. She did bear a son. She heard directly from the Lord. While the Lord was speaking to Abraham, she was sort of behind the tent door listening in. And she laughed. Her initial response was doubt and disbelief. We don't know much more from her about her life after that other than she died at 127 years old. Abraham would go on to live to 175. Okay. Now, um, this account in Genesis doesn't tell us a whole lot about Sarah. I mean, we, can, we, can get, we can put a picture together, right? It doesn't really tell us a whole lot about how she responded or received the promise that at 90 years old she would finally bear a child. And yet she is still listed in the hall of faith. Right? And it's not just because she was the matriarch. <laughs> of the Jewish people. Okay. And that brings us back to Hebrews 11, chapter 11. I had to lay all that groundwork for you, right? Because Hebrews 11, 11 gives us what it gives us. But we had to go through who Sarah was, who she is. So in Hebrews 11, 11, it says, by faith, dot, dot, dot. Since she considered him faithful who had promised, she received the power to conceive, okay? Now, despite some misguided deeds, and uh, some attempts to take an alternate route to bring about, about God's plan. And despite having difficulty, difficulty in believing God and his promise to Abraham, right, in the end, we have to conclude that Abraham and Sarah considered him faithful who had promised. That they considered him faithful who had promised. And that's why Sarah is mentioned in the Hall of Faith. Because she considered God to be faithful. 
So what does this, what does this account tell us about God? Well, the obvious one is that God is faithful. Right? That's what this account tells us about God, that God is faithful. This account, at least in Hebrews 11, is really not focused so much on Sarah's faith. Right? It's really not so much Sarah's faith that is on display here as much as it wants us to focus on God's faithfulness, which is on display, right? He is the most faithful. He is the most true. He is the most trustworthy. He is the most dependable, and he is the most uh, credible. You're never going to find anybody else who is more faithful than God, right? Think of the most trustworthy person that you can think of. Maybe that's you. (laughs) Maybe that's somebody else. But even the best of us, even the most trustworthy of us, have broken a promise along the way. Even a little one. Right? But not God. Never. Never breaks his promises. He does the impossible for Sarah. Opens her womb, so to speak, so at 90 years old she can have a son. To bring about his plan and his promises. Because it was through her line that the Messiah was going to come. Right? God keeps his promises, even if he has to work through incredibly misguided actions on our part. And Sarah and Abraham displayed some incredibly misguided actions, (laughs) right? Sarah had no reason to offer Hagar to her husband Abraham. She had no reason to do that. Furthermore, Abraham had no reason to take Hagar as his wife and to conceive a child with her. They were both in the wrong there. Furthermore, Sarah responded by trying to lay lay her guilt onto somebody else. We've seen that before in the Garden of Eden with Adam. And Sarah had no business mistreating Hagar the way that she did. There was a ton of misguided actions to bring about our own plans. And yet God worked through them. He worked through that train wreck of a situation. That's really what it is. It's just a train wreck of a situation, and he keeps his promises. Now, just to kind of fill the gaps in that story, he also showed great mercy and kindness to Hagar and Ishmael. He blessed Hagar and Ishmael. Ishmael became a great leader. He was the father of 12 princes, right? Um, now, there's a sharp distinction between him and Isaac and, <laughs> and the people of God and not the people of God. But while he lived, he showed great mercy to uh, Ishmael, right? we are supposed to take away from this uh, one verse, really, and as we consider the account of Sarah, is that God will accomplish his will, and he will fulfill his promises, always, every single time. Okay? So I wonder how many of us here tonight, and I know that we're each dealing with our own things in life. I get that. But I wonder how many of us could be reminded of God's promises would benefit by being reminded of God's promises. See, what our tendency is to do is we tend to focus on the things that God didn't promise. Right? God did not promise us health. He did not promise us wealth. He didn't even necessarily promise promise us great success. Those are the things that we like to focus on. The things that God didn't promise us. Right? However, God promises many things to his children. And he is a giver of good gifts. And he loves his children right? He just doesn't typically say, I promise, (laughs) when he makes those promises, right? So we may skip over them when we're reading them and realize that some of these are promises of God. He makes them more as statements. And since he is truth and he is the source of truth, right? And he cannot lie, they are in fact then promises. And there are a lot of them, but I'm just going to give you a few. Here's one we all know and love, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him, here's the promise, shall not perish, but have eternal life. Promise from God. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Hebrews 13, 5. You ever feel like, like Pastor Don was saying earlier, that God is distant, or he's abandoned you, or there's something going on in your life, and you just feel really, really alone. Maybe the loss of a loved one, or circumstances, or just wearing on you and you just feel like I'm, I, I, there's depression setting in. There's all sorts of things setting, settling in, right? I'm just all alone. 
Hebrews 13, 5 says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. The word for forsake is to abandon. I will never leave you and I will never abandon you if you are my child. It's a promise from God. How about Philippians 4? Who here has experienced anxiety? Some of us, most of us at some level, right? Right? Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything. About some things? No. Do not be anxious about anything. Have complete trust in God. Right? Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, not some situations, but all of them. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and, make, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. The peace of God will trans, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's another promise of God. Philippians 4, 9, 19. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ. This, is, this is, has in mind material and spiritual needs. My God will meet all of your needs. Right? Uh, don't, know how, don't know what God wants from you in life. Don't know how to live a godly life. Don't understand godliness. Are you lacking wisdom? Are you lacking discernment in something? James 1.5 If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Ask God for wisdom, and it will be given to you. Are you looking around society and you're thinking, wow, this is not going very good. And there's things just kind of weighing on you and, and kind of bearing down on you, right? Being maybe maligned or slandered for your beliefs. John 16, 33, in this world you will have tribulation. That's a promise. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world, <laughs> Right? John 6, 37, all that the Father gives will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. If you like, you've ever been in a period in your life where your sin has kind of taken over again, kind of fallen back into the same old sin over and over and over, feeling like, well, there's no way God could still love me. There's no way God will still forgive me. There's no way that I'm still in his good graces. Well, Romans 8, 1 is for you. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Last one. Revelation 21, 3 and 4. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. What an amazing promise that is. Verse 4, it gets better. He will wipe every tear from their eye. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. What a promise that is. And it is yours if you are in Christ Jesus. And this is only a small sampling of the promises of God that we have in Scripture the greatest among them being that we are saved by grace through faith, which is the context of which all of these other promises find their own context. Right? Sarah was promised by God directly right, that she would conceive. Even if she had a moment of disbelief, there was a promise. And ultimately, she considered God faithful. And by faith, the scripture tells us she received that promise. We don't hear audibly from God anymore. We don't hear audibly from God in the way that Abraham and Sarah did. And yet, in a sense, if you really think about it, in a sense, we have a more complete revelation of God than even Abraham and Sarah had. Right? Abraham never actually inherited the land of Canaan. He was told to go to this land, but it was his children that inherited it long after he had passed. But he knew something was coming, <laughs> right? And so in a sense, we have more revelation than what they had before them, right? 
we have God's word written. And his faithfulness is on page after page. Right? That's what we need to take away from this. So let it be said of us that when we need help to throw off sin that entangles us, to run with endurance, to fix our eyes on Jesus, to help us to not grow weary or lose heart, that we would, by faith, consider he who promises to help with all of these things to be faithful. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your faithfulness to us, uh, especially considering that we don't deserve it. Um, We know who we are, and and we know who you are, and we know that you're holy, and that uh, apart from you, we are not holy, we are not righteous, Lord. And so we just thank you for sending your Son, um, that in him we may have life, that we would have eternal life, that we will not perish, but have eternal life with you in glory. Will there be no more mourning or crying or, or weeping or pain? There will be no more sorrow, but only joy, only happiness, only blessedness. God, we look forward to that day. And we hold on to your promises that that day will come. And we know that that day will come because you are faithful. And so, Lord, uh, until that day comes, would you help us to keep our eyes fixed on you? Uh, not so much looking horizontally, but looking vertically so that we can remain faithful and that by faith in you, um, the faithful promise giver, we will receive all that has been promised in your name and through Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.